Well, very rarely have we brought in guests and said we have to do three shows with them. But Jamie Winship, who you're gonna hear from today, was one of those people. And I was just telling him that the reason he's here, and he's actually in the studio today, the reason he's here is because this summer during my sabbatical, someone sent me three very rough, <laughs> rough podcasts <laughs> yeah, rough. that he was a part of. It was a youth retreat and somehow there was a live squirrel in yeah. the middle of the audience and y'all had to keep getting interrupted. There were technical issues, but it still <laughs> was some of the most transforming content I've really ever heard. And mm. so if you, if you need a comparison for who this guy is, the only one I can give you is, and I know you call other people this, but he's like James Bourne. He, he has ended <laughs> up in war zones again and again and again. And I will let him tell the story, but, but I know, um, Jamie, I, I, I won't even try to attempt to tell people what you do, but, mm -hmm. but what for the last few years have you been doing that led you to all these places? In the last few years. Well, I mean, I'm thinking back, you were a policeman. That's right, how this yeah, all started. So, yeah, Should we yeah. start there? Yeah, that's probably easier to Let's understand. Let's do that. How, because, the, you know, the beautiful thing about life, life is such a beautiful mystery. And if and, and God is the, is the one who leads us into this mystery, which humans really love is mystery. And so if you'll just follow him, as he says to the young disciples, follow me and I will make you to become. That's what he says to them. I will make you to become fishers of men. And so it's when we look at our lives, the, the, the goal is to follow. And Jesus is the one who does the making and becoming mm. part of it as we follow him. So I, uh, I wanted to be a police officer. I'm from Washington, D.C. And I wanted to be a police officer because when I was in eighth grade, we weren't allowed to go to movies um, in my family. And so I just decided in eighth grade that I was going to go see what was so, uh, bad about movies. And I snuck into this movie and it was, a, a movie about a police officer. I had no idea what the movie was going to be about. I just wanted to see what's the big deal about movies. And it was this Academy Award winning movie about a New York city police officer. And, and I watched it and something inside of me just, exploded and I didn't know how to describe it but it made me weep and I knew that I was being challenged and called and named in the in the story the narrative of the movie and it was so powerful to me that at the end of the movie I went forward <laughs> in the movie ah. theater because in my mind culturally you know in a church where the church I grew up in it didn't count to God unless you went forward. And so everyone was leaving and I went forward and I stood up on the little stage in the theater, <laughs> looking up at the lights, crying. And I just said to God, I know I'm supposed, this is who I'm supposed to be. It wasn't what I was supposed to do. It was who I was supposed to be. And I, in eighth grade, and so from that day forward, uh, every decision I made was based on what I felt I was supposed to be. And so I, I wouldn't make, I wouldn't, you know, if my friends were shoplifting or whatever, I wouldn't be involved in it, not because I was religious or spiritual, but because I was driven by this sense of being. And I knew that one day I'd be on a polygraph, and so I didn't want... Wow. Right? So, so anyway, so then that's what led me, you know, through my life and in um, on the way age 17, I meet this, I'm um, in the hospital having knee surgery from a wrestling incident, and I meet this amazing nurse who um, is the person who really walked me into faith in Christ. Just, just this incredible woman. I don't know her name, never been able to find her ever again, mm -hmm. but she spent five days pouring into me, and that's a very beautiful story. And again, it was more like at 17, I recognized something about this woman I knew she was a, a single mom from West Virginia that worked her way through nursing school at night. I knew that about her. But the way she would talk to me, she, I, I recognized she was more than just a nurse. She was, she was bringing something to me from herself that was deeper than her vocation. And so I had this, and she would talk to me about my bitterness, which was just astounding to me. And I would cuss her out and I would yell at her and she would leave and she would come back the next day like we'd never met. And she would start again with this love. And I realized her love is stronger than my anger. Her love for me, who, and I'm a stranger to her, is greater than my anger aimed at her. 
And so my prayer was when I was finally released from the hospital after five days, and I'm sure she thought I was just a total waste of time because I never responded to her, but God knows. And I was going home from the hospital, and I said to God, could you teach me how to be a police officer like she's a nurse? Hmm. I didn't. She's, there were lots of nurses in that hospital. There were lots of doctors. She was something deeper than that vocation. And I knew that she was bringing her identity into her vocation, not getting her identity from her vocation. And I realized that's how I wanted to be a police officer. Went to university, met more amazing people, and then graduated and went into the police academy. Um, dream come true, 23 years old, married, newly married, and I get into the police department, and I realize very quickly that this is not going to be like the movie, right? <laughs> right? That this is a very different, dark world that, that, the, that the men and women that I worked with in the police department were just as broken and fractured as anyone we encountered on the street, you know? And um, we, we had the same issues that people mm. we were dealing with. And so in that process, I started to ask God... The question is, can, is it possible to learn another way of policing that wasn't taught in the academy? And I, I didn't know, does God answer those kind of prayers? How would God answer those kind of prayers? Does God know anything about police work, <laughs> right? Does God know what to say in the middle of a domestic dispute or in the middle of a homicide investigation? What's the role of the Holy Spirit and all of that? I just didn't know where to go to learn that. And so I just started, I kept a little notebook and I just started asking God questions and I would wait to see in how he would answer and how I would know it. Hmm. And I just started experimenting on the street in my job and I became astounded by how quickly and beautifully the Lord would, um, you know, it's the mind of Christ. It's like what the mind of Christ really is. It's, it's my mind and, the, and Christ linked. And in in, I'm a temple of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'm in union. I'm abiding in Christ. What does that mean for a police officer on the street? <laughs> and so I started, to, I started to bring my identity into my vocation like that. And that's how I got started into this whole journey. Well, and it worked. And so you were recruited many times, I know, for the CIA. Mm. You felt like... You did not want to leave because you felt pretty convicted that you are a police officer. That's right. what you do. That's right. But then some at some point that shifted and and you were overseas. Talk about that that transition and what Yeah. So, what was the right change? Yeah, well, so like the first time, yeah, that first time that interview occurred with the CIA, I was nineteen actually, and um, in university and, and I just went through the regular um, application process and I zipped through it for some reason and went to DC to be interviewed and all that and they offered me a job and I and I was just surprised and I said well no really what I really want to be is a police officer and the the <laughs> the agent that was recruiting me she said I don't think you understand how, what how high level this position is compared to a police officer and I said to her, that, no, that's not how I think about it. I'm not seeking a high position. I'm seeking to be what I believe God wants me to be, not the job, but th that part that, of who I am. And so I turned it down. But I went through the whole process, you know, went through everything they did, all of their testing and everything. And then, then so then into the police department and just learning these things, learning how to hear God, how, learning how God works in how fast does God answer prayer, this kind of thing. And then in my fifth year in the police department, um, I get a phone call from a magistrate at, at night, and he calls me and he says, I want you to come meet with me and another person I want to introduce you to in this restaurant in downtown D.C. And I go to meet, and it's, it's an operations guy from the CIA. And he's, mm. he has a folder in front of him on the table in this restaurant, and he's flipping through it, and it's cases I've worked through the five years. And he says to me, how are you, tell me that your thought process and how you work these cases. He said, because I know nobody in the academy trained you how to do this. So where did you learn how to think this way? Can you articulate it? And can you teach another person? 
and I was 28 <laughs> at the time. So, and then you're like, I prayed and God yeah. told me to do this. <laughs> and, he's, and I told him, I said, I don't think you're going to like the process I go through to come up with this kind of stuff. And he said, he, and it was interesting. He said, I don't really care about the process. I, I, I can see the result. And that impacted me because Jesus said it. It's by our fruit that people know. It's not by our words and our speeches, but it's really by the result, right? That, that people identify us as real believers. And so, um, so I articulated, I mean, he would pick a case and go, what'd you do here? And I would say, like, like you just said, I would say, well, in that situation, I knew training wise what to do, but I knew that wouldn't work. So then I would pray and I would ask God, what, what, what do you want me to know about this situation that I don't know? And what do you want me to do? And I would listen and wait and I would have ideas and I would write them down and I would try them. And then I, in this case, and I would explain to him, then I did this and I knew how to contact this guy and then what to say to this guy. And it worked. And that's when he said, yeah, he goes, yeah, I don't, I don't like that process. <laughs> but then he came back again to the results and he said, but it works, it works. Right. And so he's, then he said, let me give you a real life scenario that we're working. And he laid out this situation that they were trying to figure out overseas that they weren't able to, they, they couldn't figure out how to work forward in it. And they had already lost a person in the process. And he said, what would you do? Tell me what you would do. And so I, there, I don't know, it was about 11 PM in, in this restaurant in DC. And I just leaned back and I said to the Lord, okay, what would you, what do you want me to know? And what would you do in this scenario that this guy just laid out? How, how would I think about it? What's the right way to think about it? And then I just wait um, <laughs> for the ideas. We It's like hearing from God is fixing your eyes on Jesus, asking him a question and waiting for the answer. That's all it is. The free flow of thoughts that go through your mind when you fix your eyes on Jesus and ask him a question. One of my questions was, how fast can Jesus answer? Or do I have to light a candle? Do I have to have a six-hour quiet time to get God to respond to me? And he's with us all the time. It's the most beautiful, astounding thing. And he's, he's always there. He's always with us. And so I just asked, and I had an idea. And I said to the operations guy, I said, well, I think your whole paradigm is just wrong, wrong from the beginning. What I would do is get rid of this paradigm and build a new paradigm. And he said, what paradigm? And I told him what I would do. And he just took a napkin and wrote a dollar figure on it and slid it across. And he said, would this get, you're hired. This is the figure. Will this get you? And that's, that was how they uh, <laughs> offered me a job. Um, yeah. And so, I want to pause you right mm -hmm. there because you, you've hinted at now something that, that I walked away with from the three mm. episodes that I listened to from you at the little youth camp. And one of the things that really changed the way I do life coming back from sabbatical was, were those two questions. God, what do you want me to know? And what do you want me to do? It was right. so simple. And I, I have really changed the way I do life and ministry because of that. And it has brought me back into work in a much more um, calm, relaxed way because I don't feel the pressure right. to come up with everything all the yes, time. I really, right. and I'm teaching my mm -hmm. team, I'm like, this is just what we're going to do all the time. Anytime we get to a problem, anytime we get to anything, we're right. just going to say, God, what do you want us to know? And what do you want us to do? And we're going to trust that as we work through that problem together, that he's leading us and, and giving us the answers. That's and right. it just, it's taken so much pressure off of leadership. Yeah, absolutely. Because otherwise it's all on you. Yeah. It's all on me. Right. And, and um, these, these interesting words, the word responsibility, the word responsibility doesn't exist in any language before the Industrial Revolution. It's that the word responsibility is not in scripture, nowhere. And neither is the, is the idea of expectations, responsibility mm -hmm. and expectations. And those two words drive us into bondage because um, responsibility and expectation produce failure. Mm. And, and and a bur and burden, and so what we do what we do see in scripture is the ability to respond. Mm -hmm. That's what we have. We have the ability to respond to God, but God's not calling us and saying, "Carry I want this burden." Right? He's not saying, "Follow me." <laughs> Nobody and ever taught me that. If can, anything, they showed me the opposite. That's right. Can you imagine Jesus saying to the disciples, "And here's your list of responsibilities and expectations"? He he never does that to people. Mm. He he's saying. I'm you have the ability to respond to my invitation. Will you say yes or no? 
And what are we supposed to expect? David, King David says it in Psalm 27. He says, he says, expect the Lord. What are your expectations when you go into this scenario and this Muslim context? We expect the Lord. What's your expectations? We expect the Lord. And, and when you're reading through scripture and, wow. and he's invite, challenging Gideon and Moses and all these ones, and they all say the same thing. We're not capable. We're not <laughs> old enough. It, the idea doesn't make any sense. You don't know who Pharaoh is. You don't know who I am. This is the typical way humans respond to God in, in his invitation. And his answer is always, am I not going to be with you? Like you talk about this, like it's all on you. Do you. Am I not the one sending you? That's always his response. And because it's really what we don't believe, you know, it's, it's okay. The Lord's inviting me. And then he, I don't know where he's going to stay, but I'm going to go and it's all going to be on me. And as soon as you believe that you're actually separating yourself from God in that false belief. Well, one of the things you talk a lot about is identity. In fact, you've written a book about it. And and I don't know, I'm just going to say right now, I don't know that I agree. Like we need to talk about your definition of it because yeah. the whole time I was listening, I would have used the word calling. Mm-hmm. I would have used the mm-hmm. word, you know, with, like the police officer thing. I wouldn't have ever put that into my identity. But, right. but it's deeper than that, I think, right. for you. Talk a little bit about what you mean by identity. Well, think of calling as doing. Identity is being. And being always informs doing always. Being always precedes doing. And so Jesus says a good tree produces good fruit. So the ontology, the being of the tree is goodness. And what it does is produces good fruit. The, if the ontology or the essence of the tree is evil, it can only produce bad fruit. What we concentrate too much on is the fruit. Mm. Instead of instead of being. So if so it, it, when you when you're trying to understand what is God like the, it, the question is what's the ontology of God? What is God first? If you don't understand who God is, you'll never understand what he does or or why it's done. It won't make any sense to you. So we have this this beautiful if God what's the identity of God? God is love. Mm. God is love. So everything that comes out of God his calling in the world it comes from the being of love. And so then when we watch Jesus as the exact representation of the invisible God, we know that Jesus has come out of love. And then when Jesus go, is baptized and he's being commissioned into ministry and the advent of the spirit, he receives his identity from God. And it's not what he's going to do. It's who he is. It's not his calling of Messiah. It's who he is. This is my son. This is, this is the son, the beloved son, the one, the son that I'm pleased in. This is who this is. The vocation of this, the doing of this being is Messiah, is Lamb of God, is take away the sin of the world. But who can, there were many Messiahs, Many messiahs right. came in that vocation, but they weren't the true identity of the one to be messiah, right? Mm-hmm. To enact that vocation. So I'm a police officer. That's my calling. That's my vocation. That's what I'm doing. But my identity precedes it. That, for, the reason for that is, what if I can't be a police officer anymore? Right. Then I have nothing. And this is what destroys people, good people. Um, especially in police and special forces and the NFL and these places where your whole calling is your identity, it can't be because the calling wasn't there before the identity. The identity is what God, God knit together in your mother's womb. You, not a calling, you. Mm-hmm. And that you, that identity will, will move towards specific callings because of who you are. Today, I want you to close with this story about your son. Okay. And, and I know that for, for many people mm. listening, if you don't know, he's going to end up going overseas a lot and, and taking your family into mm-hmm. literally moments where the whole country is falling apart. Right. So I want to give you that preface before you hear the story, but, but let's close with this story. So talk about, yeah, your son. He was, you were heading into sixth grade with him? Yeah, he was, so he was going into sixth grade and um, he'd never been in the U.S. in a school. And so he, I told him, you know, you can, you can go to public school or private school or homeschool, whatever you want to do. I want you to just ask the Lord what he wants you to know and do. 
And so even a fifth grader can do that. And so he did, and he said, I want to go to public school. And we're like, okay, that's why. Because I want to be with kids that don't know Christ. Okay, so move into this place, and, and it's, a, it's a, a very rough middle school, very difficult. And he gets beat up and robbed the first day. <laughs> And he comes home and he's, uh, I'm thinking I didn't hear God correctly. <laughs> and we, it, it's interesting. And I said, well, no, that's not how it works. Because just because the Lord invites you into something doesn't mean it's just the easiest thing you've ever done. Wow. Like, that's not true. And so as a parent, I couldn't, we couldn't just pull him out of the school and go, yeah, God made a mistake because it was hard and there were mean people there. Like, that's, that would be to to give him a false view of God and the world. And so I said to him, listen, when, when you ask God a question and God invites you into something and you say, yes, obedience is to hear and respond, to hear and respond, and that's greater than sacrifice. So we're going to stay the whole school year, but you know, I'm going to teach you how to fight. I'm going to teach you how to protect yourself <laughs> and all that good stuff, <clears throat> but you need to stay. And it was a, it was a amazing year for him. It was very hard, and he was so beautiful how he dealt with it. But one of the things we were praying about is, you know, God, what is his unique identity? And um, because, because the Lord will tell him, not me. And so I think one of the greatest things you can teach your children is how to, is how to hear from God and to know who they are. If they can hear from God and know who they are, they can go anywhere and they'll be fine. Um, So anyway, he comes to me one day and he says, I, he says in sixth grade, I know my identity in the kingdom. And I said, great, what is it? And he said, I'm a skateboarder for Jesus. And I said, okay, okay well, hmm, I didn't really think of that kind of identity, but okay. <laughs> All right, we'll start there. And I said, do you have a skateboard? And he said, no. And I said, well, so let's get a skateboard. So we get him this you know, cheap skateboard. And he goes out in the driveway and he just starts working on skateboarding. And he's, he's, you know, frankly awful. He just falls all the time. And I'm like, wow, this is going to be a hard identity to work <laughs> out because he's not very coordinated. But, but he really, he's, he's just sticks with it and he loves it. And, and if, if, if he's like, dad, if you don't fall, you don't learn. I'm like, wow, just if you learn that lesson in life, great. And he keeps going and he actually gets pretty good. And by eighth grade, he's quite good. And, um, and then I know that we're going to get sent to Baghdad. And so I'm going to break it to them that we're going to be sent overseas. And just for context, this is yeah. in the middle of the war. Right, right. 2003 <laughs> and four. Yeah. yeah. And so, and I know our team's going to get sent. And so I tell him one day, hey, listen, we're going to move to Baghdad. And, um, you know, this is what we're going to do next. And we're going to be there for a while. And he says to me, isn't there a war going on there? And I said, yeah. And he said, so there's not probably not any skateboarding there. And I said, I'm sure there's not. And he was devastated. And he said to me, dad, you know my identity. How can you take me to a place where I cannot become who I'm supposed to be? And I went, oh, I was, I was like, wow. And then I said, let's me and you both pray about this because this is, it, this won't be how God works this out. This will work out, but let's both pray about it. So we did for five days. And then he came back to me. He's eighth grader. And he says, he says, okay, dad, I believe that God's saying to me to just trust you, trust you as my dad. And I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to go with joy and I'm not going to question it or anything. And, and so I'm just going to go with this. And I said, I think that's great. And I think the Lord, the Lord told me that he has your identity in mind and that somehow Baghdad is a good idea. Mm. Right, and so we go and we get there, and he um, brings his skateboard, and because the war is on, raging, and we live in the central Baghdad, and we don't, we're not military, so we don't live on a military base. We have to live in the population and negotiate with the population, and difficult. But so on certain times of day, he could get out and skateboard in the street. And um, one day he's skateboarding in the street, and this. M1 tank comes zipping around. An M1 tank is this massive piece of armored vehicle. Comes down the street and they drive really fast. And he's skateboarding down the street and he has long blonde hair. And the tank sees him and they they hit the brakes. And they the top pops open and this American National Guardsman looks at and he goes, who are you? Who are you, kid? Who are you? And our son says, yeah, I'm an American. We live over there. My parents work for the government. And uh, the guy says... 
the guy says, hold on a second. And then he goes back down and he comes back, he climbs all the way out and it's a national guard team from California <laughs> and they're all skateboarders <laughs> and they're so excited. And so we have this picture of both our youngest, uh, that son and our other son, our older son, um, skateboarding with this, this national guardsman while the other guys are guarding the tank, which I'm sure isn't against protocol, but then Caleb, this, our youngest son goes in, goes in the house after that happens. And he writes an article for uh, a skateboarding magazine. We didn't know he did this. And he sends it to the skateboarding magazine and they publish it. It's called Skate Baghdad was the name of the article. So these guys yeah. then tell your kid what? They tell him that, that they're guarding the park at night so up across the street from where we live. There's a park in central Baghdad that's about like, it's like um, Central Park in New York City. It's huge, has a zoo in it. And it has all these fountains, <clears throat> excuse me, but the fountains are empty because of the war. Perfect skateboard. So it's like a dream skate park <laughs> and there's nobody in it and it's guarded by these tanks. And so the tank team says, we, we're guarding the gate, you know, in the afternoons and in the evening. If you want to come in here and skate, you can. And so again, we have these pictures of him going in there. So, so we go over there one of these days and walk by the tank guys into the park. And all these Iraqi young people, you know, that the war's on and there's nothing to do. Everything's closed. They come into the park. They let them into the park. And, and we have filmed this video of Caleb and Ben, our other son, skateboarding in these empty pools and fountains, teaching these Iraqi kids how to skateboard mm. and handing out skateboards that the um, skate magazine had sent them as payment for the article. And he starts this skate club in Baghdad <laughs> during the war during the war and it was and they could only <laughs> skate at certain times it was the funniest thing and the Iraqi Iraqi kids had never seen anything hadn't seen skateboarding because because they've been under a boycott for 10 years and had no internet or anything so they had no access to the outside world so it was this and so Caleb was just in heaven mm. in that and then later when we got moved out to to Jordan after our um, job in Baghdad was finished. We got moved over to Jordan and Caleb immediately, by then he was in 11th grade and he, we move over into Jordan and he immediately goes downtown Amman, Jordan with his skateboard right in the center of the downtown. And there's like, uh, there's an island where cars drive around and, and rails and stairwells. And he just starts skating up and down and the policemen come over to him the Jordanian police officers, and they're like, what is, what are you doing? What is this? And Caleb's like, this is skateboarding. And they're like, who are you? And he said, I'm an American. My parents work for the government. And they said, we like, we like what you're doing. And they stop the traffic. They divert the traffic away from this area. So Caleb is free to skateboard. And Caleb comes home and he's like, dad, I'm in heaven. The police here are not preventing me from skateboarding. They're making it so I can skateboard. Wow. It's unbelievable. The next day he goes back and there's a group of Jordanian kids with skateboards waiting to skate with him. And they begin skating there every day. And one day a Red Bull representative is visiting him on Jordan and she stops and she sees Caleb grinding a rail skateboarding. And she gets out and she walks up to him and says, who are you? And, you know, he says his thing. And she says, we're looking for... Um, to sponsor our first uh, skateboarder in the Middle East, would you like to be the one? And he's <laughs> like, yep. And then they have their first Middle East competition and he wins it. And then he goes on, he starts a skateboard company and the King of Jordan gave him land for a skate park in Jordan. So, and then he ends up going I to mean. business school. So, my, you know, I, he always says when people ask him, like, if God says you're a skateboarder for Jesus and then tells you to move to Baghdad, you move to Baghdad as wow. fast as you can. Ugh that story. I just, I, I know everybody listening right now is going, well, what is my identity? What does it look like for me? I've never had God tell me that. What would you say to them to pray? And I know we'll be back again next week, but. So, uh, just, it's just simply to ask, spend some time in quiet. And there, it's a bit of a process, but simply just to say, to, to in prayer, just ask the Lord, what do you call me? When you talk about me, what do you say about me? If you were going to wake me up in the middle of the night, what would what would you what name would you call out to wake me up? That's distinct in me from anyone else you've ever made. What would you call me? Mm. It's so beautiful. Thanks for watching. 
I hope you enjoyed and there's a ton more content for you. So go down below and you can subscribe to my channel and we post about twice a week. So come on, come hang out with us.